Good morning. And welcome to Zion United Church of Christ, where we've been worshiping together since 1854 in downtown Mount Clemens, Michigan. Wherever you are in your journey with God, all are welcome to worship here with us at Zion. A few announcements before we get started here today. Remember to like us on Facebook and follow us on YouTube, as you can see at the bottom of your screen there. Thank you to all of those who made our Mother's Day service wonderful and amazing. If you haven't seen it yet, you can catch it on YouTube and our Facebook pages. We've honored our mothers, and now it's time to honor our fathers. So if those of you who saw on Facebook yesterday, Marge Mann posted a Facebook post um, saying to bring your favorite picture of your dad so we can include it into our Father's Day service. So we are going to put a little video together for you. So if you have a favorite picture, you can go ahead and bring that into church here. Make sure that their name and your name is on the back of it so we know who to get it back to. You can also email us a picture at info at zionuccmountclemens.com. That's zionuccmtclemens.com. We want to make sure everyone gets their pictures back, and we look forward to putting that together for our Father's Day service. I was just informed about two minutes before the service that today actually is Reverend Alt's birthday. So Reverend Alt, if you're joining us online, we wish you a very happy birthday today from your Zion family. An update on our organ restoration. So we've had the electricians fix the switches. We have lights in there with no fires and it looks amazing. The walls have been redone. We have a brand new ceiling. Uh, our facilities committee has been working all week. The ceiling looks gorgeous. I know I spoke with Kathy Tinkler uh, yesterday. It used to be plaster like our walls out here. Now it's uh, wooden uh, tongue and groove slats that are on the ceiling. It doesn't even need to be painted. It looks so good right now. So the organ folks are thrilled. They, uh, we wish you could all see how cool it is in there. I am going to try to get a picture or two to show you during announcements next week or the following week. Um, but the organ company has resumed working on the refurbishing of the organ, and that should be done in a couple of weeks. We will keep you posted. More to come. The stream team is having an end of the year get together today after the service to celebrate all of their many accomplishments over the last two years. We'll be playing a, a, a trivia Jeopardy game that Amy Stahl worked tirelessly on. I'm talking arts and crafts and tape and construction paper. It was, I mean, it, it's not, not to mention, you know, coming up with all the questions that we're going to have to answer. I'm not sure how I'm going to do, to be honest with you. But uh, we will be playing that. Uh, we'll be recording the game and then uh, putting it together as a nice little video. So we'll get that posted in the next few weeks as well for you all. Uh, some of you may have noticed that our YouTube channel uh, got some more views this week. So previously, our highest performing video on YouTube was actually the first song that Amy and I sang, which was The Prayer, and that was sitting at about 728 views. We then posted the video from Mother's Day of You Raise Me Up, and it passed the prayer in the in amount of views within two days. And right now, uh, we currently have 1,935 views on that one video. So the cool part about that is uh, that most every other video that we have on our YouTube page has also seen an increase in the amount of views as well. So people found us and now they're watching what we have to offer. So if you happen to be one of the new folks who found our church and are catching us live right now, we want to welcome you to Zion. This morning, our Zion Choir will be singing I Will Rise. That's going to happen right after the call to worship before the intro video. Our lector today is going to be Bill Prawl, not Bill Moore. And the lovely flowers on the altar this morning are in honor of Evelyn Cloco for her 96th birthday that will be on the 26th. <laughs> 
So May 26th is her birthday. Um, it's also, they're also in memory of Ralph Cloco, uh, who passed away also on May 26th in 2019. So those are placed by Carol, Lisa, and Bud Bone. With that, let us now enter into worship. Good morning. Uh, just remember this morning we come into our readings. We have Bill substituting for Bill, but we got no no Henrys or Sams. <laughs> Please join me with a call to worship. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make His face to shine upon us. That Your way may be known upon earth. Your saving power among all nations.
Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 67. Our God, be kind and bless us. Be pleased and smile. Then everyone on earth will learn to follow you, and all nations will see your power to save us. Make everyone praise you and shout your praises. Let the nations celebrate with joyful songs, because you judge fairly and guide all nations. Make everyone praise you, God, and shout your praises. Our God has blessed the earth with a wonderful harvest. Pray for his blessing to continue and for everyone on earth to worship our God. For our New Testament reading this Sunday morning, comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision of someone from Macedonia who was standing there and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we began looking for a way to go to Macedonia. We were sure that God had called us to preach the good news there. So we sailed straight from Troas to Samothrace, and the next day we arrived in Neapolis. From there, we went to Philippi, which is a Roman colony in the first district of Macedonia. We spent several days in Philippi. Then on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to a place by the river where we thought there would be a Jewish meeting place for prayer. We sat down and talked with the women who came. One of them was Lydia, who was from the city of Thyatria and sold expensive purple cloth. She was a worshiper of the Lord God, and he made her willing to accept what Paul was saying. Then after, she and her family were baptized. She kept on begging us, if you think I really do have faith in the Lord, come stay in my home. Finally, we accepted her invitation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel this morning comes from the fifth chapter of John. It's verses uh, 1 through 9. And in this we have a healing story where Jesus uh, heals a man who's been sitting by the porticos, the pools of Bethsatha in the city of Jerusalem. For He's been there, he's been not well for 38 years. And so this is a healing story for this man. John chapter 5, beginning of verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, 
in Hebrew called Bezata, which is five porticos. And in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him and knew that he had been lying there a long time, he said to the man, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered Jesus, Sir, I have no person to put me into the pool when the water is troubled. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to the man, Rise, take up your pallet and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his pallet and he walked. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Now, if you're able, would you please stand with me as uh, we confess our faith with this, these words from this ancient Christian teaching derived from the New Testament. Let's join together in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us say again what we believe. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Well, friends, uh, in our, our interim time here, before we get into the sermon, delve together into the Word of God, uh, Right now, I just want to let you know our, our office is open uh, Monday through Friday, 9 to 1. Jennifer Kern or Haver, God bless her, is work, working as our interim administrator uh, slash secretary. She's here on Mondays and Fridays from 9 a.m. to 1. Uh, and and I'm, hey, I'm around. You can come see me. I'm here Monday to Thursdays usually. So we're open Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's just usually I'm reading something or doing something. But you can all come in. We're here from 9 to 1. And, of course, Joe is here as well. We just want to give you an update on that. Uh, and the council's working on that situation. Uh, also, we have this next weekend, we have Memorial Day come up, so please be safe, have a good time uh, with your families and your friends at uh, your various picnics and parades and things of that nature. Uh, also, Dr. Bray will be filling our, our pulpit, and so come and hear a good and a lively and a timely word. You always get an excellent message with Dr. Bray. We thank him for being such a, a, a wonderful guy and a great, a great preacher here in our church. So please come out for Memorial Day next weekend to hear a good word from Dr. Bray. Uh, also remember, as we come into Memorial Day, I think about this every year, uh, amidst our festivities, it's Memorial Day is more than the opening of the summer. Uh, Memorial Day is a time to remember men and women who have died in service to our country. Certainly, we always honor all of our veterans as we ought to, and remember veterans specifically in November. But here uh, in May, uh, it's been upon my heart, it's uh, Time for us to remember those who have died uh, for our country and to remember them with love and with consideration. It's been on my mind and heart, particularly this last couple months, because we're Jennifer, Ian, and I are planning. Hopefully, we get to go to Gettysburg here in, in July. We're going to take some time to go out east, and we want to go uh, out out to Gettysburg, but probably not the weekend when it's Biker Weekend, because it's going to be all filled up. So that's one weekend we were planning on going. It was it's like a big Biker Weekend there, which would be fine, but it, it's. The hotels, we'd have to stay far away. So th that's, that's a side note, but please remember that Memorial Day is really about remembering those who have died, and so let's give thanks for their lives. Uh, but without any uh, further ado, uh, would you join me in prayer as we come here this morning into the Word of God? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your great love. We thank you for the power of your Spirit. We thank you for, no matter what we face, you are in the midst of it with us, that you carry us to the mountain and you carry us to the healing waters, but you carry us and you lead us and you guide us. And healing comes in your presence. Healing in, comes in your presence. Restoration comes in your presence. And that healing often will produce uh, 
a confession of faith, but it's just merely being in your presence and from your goodness and from your love that we are healed. And so we thank you for that for this morning, Lord, for your healing and for your grace. Bless and watch over your sons and daughters this morning and throughout this week and help us to walk in the power of your love and to share that with all. For we pray in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Anointed One, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Lord. Amen. It struck me this morning, I just want to read this again, this, this first hymn we sang, uh, Glorious Things of Thee Have Spoken, which a lovely hymn tune, but the second verse, See the streams of living waters springing from eternal love. The streams of living waters springing from eternal love. That kind of gets at what these readings are talking about here this morning. See the streams of living waters springing from eternal love. I just wanted to reference that really quickly. This morning I have a text, and the text comes from the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. It's Revelation 21 and 10, and Revelation chapter 21 and verse 10 says this, And in the Spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Well, we're just through what we um, would like to call, what they're calling in some communities around here, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but we're just almost through it. They're calling it uh, No Mow May. Have you heard about that? Don't mow your lawn for the month of May. I don't know, that goes in some places, but I bet in some subdivisions in Macomb and some in Gross Point Woods are not real happy about that. Let me tell you, No Mow May. Some various communities around here are doing that. The idea is don't mow your lawn for the entire month of May. I don't know, it'll get rather long, but some kids, I know some kids in Royal Oak and some kids over in Northville who were trying to be ecologically conscious talked to the city councils in those communities, maybe a few other communities as well, and they were promoting the idea, voluntary of course, of not mowing your lawn for the month of May, allowing the dandelions to grow so the bees could go and get from the dandelions and then the bees cultivate from the dandelions. I'm not sure of all the science. I'm not real smart about these things. But the bees go to the dandelions, and the bees, of course, supply our food, right? They help our food supply. So it, it's about being ecologically conscious, this whole idea of no, mo may. Well, I, I kind of compromised on that. There's a guy down the street from me. He's, not, he's had no, mo may, but he, he also might try to do no, mo June. He might get in trouble with that. His, his grass is going up real high. And there's another fellow right next to him. I mean, he's right out there. He, geez, if he could be out there in the middle of April, even when it's, we get some snow, he'd be out there. He's mowing his lawn and putting down all kinds of chemicals, which are just really pushing all the weeds underneath, right? So these guys are right next to each other. So I wonder what their, their neighborly relations are like. But um, I kind of compromise on that. I, I, I mowed the lawn, but in, in my beds, in my beds, I, I let some of the dandelions grow up there so the bees can kind of go and do their things. But... I kind of went right down the middle with it. Well, whether you've mowed or not, May itself is almost at an end. Again, I've already had to mow a couple of times, and today or tomorrow, I'm going to be working like a soldier, I think. I've got to go out there and mow the lawn again and pull some weeds and mulch and do a bunch of other things. And I've got all these uh, weed trees in the backyard. I've got to work on that. So I'm going to be busy after Jeopardy, after Zion Jeopardy, which we're going to film after church. I've got to go home. I've got to get at it a little bit. It's time for the spring cleaning. It's time for the summer spruce up or whatever you want to call it. We have to get out there and work in the yards if we haven't already done it one way or another. And I talk about no mow May this morning just specifically for this person. It is a busy time, am I right? This is a busy time of year every year, COVID or no, or coming out of COVID or no. It is a busy time of year with getting the lawn ready, opening up for spring and summer, and Memorial Day certainly is sort of the beginning of summer for most people. That's why I wanted to mention the true meaning of Memorial Day. But Memorial Day itself is the beginning of summer, and that's fine. That's good for what it is. And so we're busy with all that, and those with children or grandchildren, it's the end of the school year with all the end-of-the-year celebrations and transitions going on and graduations. It seems, I don't know, I must be getting old and crotchety. It seems like there's more of that now than when I was a, a teenager. I don't, I don't know. It's been only 30 years or so, but it seems like there's more. But whether it is actually more or not, it is a busy time of year. Even in a time when we are still just coming out of a pandemic, it is a busy time of year. So I say this all this morning in a shaggy dog kind of way to talk about busyness. 
Busyness can be a good thing, except when it's not. When we allow ourselves to get overwhelmed, when we allow ourselves to be overcome with busyness on the road to realizing some sort of perfect ideal or so we think. If we're busy, we're going to realize perfection in some way. When we go down that path, busyness is not such a good thing. So what I'm saying is, is that busyness in life, regardless of who you are or where you are on your life's journey, busyness in life, as with most things, is good in moderation. Be sure to ask me about my other penchant, my penchant for procrastination. That's a whole other matter. I am the king of procrastination, not much else, but when it comes to procrastination, I, I do all right. Now, I say this all this morning because we have this image from the book of Revelation, the image of the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And this image is not one of human perfection or of human striving, but it's God's new creation. God completing things and fulfilling all at the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's really what the book of Revelation is speaking of. The second coming of Christ and the holy city Jerusalem, which in, remember it's coded language, the holy city Jerusalem is the church. The church itself coming down out of heaven from God being prepared as a bride for her bridegroom. That's what the Bible speaks of, being prepared as a bride for her bridegroom who is Jesus the King, Jesus the Christ. Now, the holy city, the holy city of Jerusalem, the church is not a building. It is not an institution. It is not a doctrine as such. It cannot be reduced to the Roman Catholic Church. That's part of the church, but it's out of the Roman Empire, Catholic and universal. It cannot be reduced to the Presbyterian Church, or the Anglican Church, or the Free Church, or the Baptist Church, or the Pentecostal Church, or any other denomination you want to speak of, or the Evangelical Church, much of which is, uh, if not captive, is, is largely determined by contemporary and commercial kind of culture. It can't be reduced to any denominational church. It can't be reduced to the United Church of Christ. We come very definitively out of an evangelical and reformed heritage, a Lutheran and Presbyterian heritage. I used to joke about it a little bit, just in fun, a little tongue-in-cheek, saying, well, what does it mean to be evangelical and reformed, or Lutheran and, and, and reformed? Well, evangelical means to be Lutheran, and reformed means to be Presbyterian in character. Of course, we have a congregational polity, congregational government. If that doesn't muddy the waters, all those things, I don't know what does. But I used to say to... Uh, my friend Phil Grove, God rest his soul. I used to say it was a little bit like being a Donnie and Marie church. What does he mean, Donnie and Marie? Well, a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. And he used to laugh at that. We had a good time speaking of that. But no church, no tradition can be reduced to one thing or another. We're speaking of the church, the holy city, coming down out of heaven at the second coming of Jesus. At the second coming of Jesus. A church that is holy because it's been made holy by God. Amen? A church that has been made holy by God's love. A church in its people who are redeemed ultimately by God's grace, by God's love. A church that is gathered by the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, it comes directly from God. A people of covenant. Not merely the promises we make to one another, but to walk together, but the promise of God. Am I right? The church is built upon the promises of God and built upon the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The church is a people of promise, a people of covenant, a people gathered by the Holy Spirit, transformed by His grace, saved by His love, again, a bride adorned for her bridegroom, Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible's getting at in the book of Revelation. That's what Revelation 21 and 10 is speaking of. It is an idea. The church, the church, this one and all the other ones, the church, is something that only realizes its full mission at the second coming of Jesus. This is what the book of Revelation is saying. The church is an idea, like freedom is an idea. Like holiness is an idea. And whether we're speaking of freedom, or holiness, or the church, or any other thing that really is ultimately based in an idea, you know it when you see it. You know it when you feel it. 
That's the way holiness and freedom and church really work. You know it when you feel it right down deep in your heart. You know it when you experience it through the working of the Lord's grace. But if we are too busy, I'm coming around on my point. If we are too busy in life with the day-to-day, which demands our attention. And of course, let's be entirely honest, the day-to-day in life on some level does demand our attention. And we have to live in the day. And we have to attend to and take care of the business of today. I gotta mow my lawn a little while, so I gotta move this along, you hear what I'm saying? We gotta take care of those mundane things, the day-to-day things. We all have to, regardless of who we are or where we are. But, because you can't be out there daydreaming and navel-gazing all the time. Not even if you're a pastor, you have things that you got to get done. But if we become, nonetheless, too busy with the day-to-day, and if we become overwhelmed with the day-to-day details, we're going to miss what is going on right in front of our noses. Do you see that? If we become so overwhelmed, so preoccupied with the day-to-day, good or bad, we will miss what is going on and the new thing that God is doing right in front of our noses. Do you want to be made well? That's a simple question. I can't think of something more direct than that. Can you? Do you want to be made well in your soul, in your heart, in your mind, right down deep in your body, all the way down to your bones, who you are? Do you want to be made well? Well, who doesn't? Who doesn't want to be made well? Actually, um, actually, there are some people, you know them. There are some people who don't want to be made well, they just want to stay where they are. Am I right? There are some people who don't want to be made well in the ways in which Jesus is speaking of being made well, in the ways in which Jesus is speaking of being healed. There are some people who would say, no, I, I really, when it comes down to it, if you put the truth lasso around them, they really don't want to be made well. They'd rather just stay where they are doing the same old thing, doing the same old thing, because they know what that is. And being made well might be scary, because there might be some change going on. So I actually know there are some people who don't want to be made well. You know, one cold January morning, inside the gates of the old city, as it speaks of in the Bible, inside the old uh, gates of the old city in Jerusalem, we sat outside the church of St. Anne which surrounds the biblical pools of Bethesda, or Bethesda, as it's talked about in today's gospel. Bethesda is related to the name Bethesda. I'm not talking about the town of Maryland. There's probably seven or eight towns in the whole country of Israel named Bethesda. Beth, B-E-T-H, means house. So you go to Bethlehem. Beth means house. Lechem, see, I did that pretty well. Lechem means bread. So Bethlehem means house of bread. Bethesda refers to the house of the pools, Zata being the pools. So we sat outside this church of St. Anne. Now a brief word about the church of St. Anne, which is inside the old city of Jerusalem. The church of St. Anne was really built only in the 19th century. It was rebuilt by Napoleon. And uh, the Ottoman uh, sultan at the time, the Ottoman Turks, in Turkey, the Ottoman Turks controlled what is now Palestine or Israel, whatever you want to call it, for 400 years, and that ended at the end of World War I. The Ottoman Turks were allied with Germany in the First World War. At the end of the war, they lost their empire. But anyways, in the 1800s, Napoleon helped out the Ottoman Sultan, and so he gave him a church, or a place to build a church inside Jerusalem. And Napoleon had this church built on the ruins of what had been a Byzantine, in other words, an Orthodox Christian church in like the year 300 AD. So he built this Catholic church there today. That's where we went. And it goes back and forth. I won't get into the whole history between the Orthodox and the Catholics. Let's just say the Orthodox and the Catholics in that part of the world, it's like the Jets and the Sharks or the East Coast, West Coast route view. They don't get along. And I don't mean that to be curt or flip. It's just where it is. But, but this church, this is a modern church. We're going to go and see it because around the church of St. Anne, named for Anne being the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary, around, around, inside the church of St. Anne are these pools which is where today's gospel is. So we went there on this cold January morning to see these pools. And we sat in front of this church, unable to enter, because the priest said, it's COVID time and you can't come in. So we were unable to enter this church, and we sat outside of it on a cold morning in January in the city of Jerusalem. 
We are unable to enter, unable to see the ancient pools that are spoken of today in the Gospel in John 5, unable to see these ancient pools of healing which this poor sick man who had been sick for 38 years wished to go down to, unable to see that, the pools of Basata, which had healed so many before him, that had restored sight to the blind and gave movement of limb back to the paralyzed and the infirm, we were unable to go in and to see these actual pools. And we sat outside the church in the Muslim quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. And here's the important thing. As we sat outside this church on this cold day in January, we ate bread, fresh bread, hot out of the oven. Our guide and another minister and I was on the tour with, they went down into the Muslim quarter and they bought these great big loaves of freshly baked bread, hot right out of the oven, fresh. And we opened up these big loaves and you could see the steam coming out of the bread and we plopped in some falafel, which they'd also bought, some just delicious, most wonderful falafel. We put it in the bread. And then we put some za'atar. The za'atar, Jennifer, it's what, salt and thyme? We put that on top of the falafel so we have the fresh bread, steam coming up, falafel in there, and za'atar, which is salt and thyme. We made like a little falafel sandwich and we ate that. I forgot all about the cold. I forgot all about the cold. Our hearts along with our bellies were full, and let me assure you my belly was full, because I had more than one piece of bread and more than one piece of falafel, if you catch my meaning. We were quite literally, if not dramatically, made well. We never went inside the church or saw the pools. Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? This man had been sick. This man had been hurting for 38 years. For 38 years he had not been well in his body, mind, or in his soul, or in his spirit. Now one of two things. It was either a situation where no one could help him, no one knew how to help him, to help him walk again. That could have been very true. Nobody knew how to help him. And probably, and this is important, don't miss this, probably, as you delve into this, no one cared to help him. Even if you don't know how to be of assistance to another directly to solve their problem, you can still be of assistance in some way. You can still help them. You can still show them that you care. So maybe no one know, knew how to help him or nobody could help him. But more importantly, nobody cared to help him. A couple of points. Water is great. We're talking about water in the pools, right? Water is great. Water is essential to life. Water is nourishing. Water is what your body needs. But there's nothing magical about water. There's nothing magical about water, shaken or stirred. Water is water. Holy water, I don't care if it's in a font in a Catholic church or in a baptistry in a Baptist church or water here in this church or a Lutheran church or whatever, Water is water. The water itself is not holy. The intention might be holy, but the water itself is not holy. Holy water, again, is just water. And I can tell you for a fact that not only is holy water just water, but I can tell you for a fact that the water of the Clinton River, right down there, the water of the Clinton River is cleaner than the water of the River Jordan. So this pastor here did not bring back any bottles of uh, Pepsi bottles with water in it from the River Jordan. I'm not, I wasn't interested in that. The water of the Clinton River is a mite site cleaner than the water of the River Jordan. So in other words, give water its due. Respect water. Be careful on the water when you're out boating and so forth. And be careful around water. Because water sustains life, but water also takes life. But water itself is water. Second, be a person who cares about others. Be a human being who cares about other human beings, who also bear the image of God, as do you. While I'm making my way to the pool, Lord, or sir, while I'm making my way to the pool, someone else steps ahead of me. You know what you can do? Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy who steps in front of the other guy who's trying to make his way to the pool. Don't be that guy who steps over somebody else going up on your way to the top or wherever the heck you're going. Don't be that guy on the 696 in your $80,000 pickup truck who passes on the right because, hey, I'm only going 75 miles an hour and you need to go 85. Don't be that guy. 
For one thing, you send our insurance rates up high and they're already high enough, but don't be that guy. Don't be that guy on the hurry to somewhere else who can't help somebody else out. Don't be that guy. I read somewhere, maybe you did too, I read somewhere that the first will be last and the last will be first. Am I right? I read that somewhere that the first will be last and the last will be first. That is indeed at the second coming of the Lord Jesus, but that is also in this life for those who trust in God, for those who place their faith in Jesus. He says the first will be last and the last will be first. That doesn't just apply to the great and mighty and the wealthy and those lacking in humility, though certainly it does reply to that, and Jesus speaks of the great eschatological reversal of fortune, to use all the fancy words. But what it comes right down to is it applies to each and every one of us. Am I right? It applies to each and every one of us. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Don't be that guy who's going to be in a rush and step over somebody else on the way to the pool. Amen? Don't be him. I heard somewhere that the Lord washed his disciples' feet. He washed their feet. They're nasty, dirty, broken feet. He got down there, they weren't too nasty for him. They weren't too smelly for him. They weren't too dirty for him. He got down and he washed their feet. Lovingly, he cradled their feet in his hand. Be that guy. The Lord Jesus came to be the servant of all. Don't be the person who jumps in line. Don't be the guy in the $80,000 pickup truck who's got to go around you because you're only going 75 miles an hour and he's on his rush to somewhere because he's important. Nobody's that important. Don't be that guy. I hope he's watching this morning. Don't be that guy. Follow the man who washed the feet of his disciples. Be that guy. Be that person. Do you want to be made well? He didn't say everything will be perfect in life. He didn't say all things will be ideal when you come to know him or when you're in his presence or when you meet him. He said, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Now in the gospel it is true that the man in the story, he stands up and he takes his mat and he walks on his way. The story is a miracle and it's going to show us that, that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Lord, the anointed one, the one sent by God, the one who brings healing, the one who makes us well. It is going to show us who the person of Jesus Christ really is, who he is. But the point is, and this is the point, don't miss this, you and I, all of us, are truly made well in the presence of Jesus the Christ, amen? We are made well in his presence. Even without a confession of faith, we are made well in his presence because that's who he is. That's who he is. He brings mercy and healing and light and love, and he makes us well. He makes us well in a way in which nobody else can make us well. Wellness and love comes from God. And so regardless of your present circumstance, good or bad, do not be so immersed in whatever it is. Do not be so immersed in your present circumstance. Do not be overcome, overcome and overwhelmed by where you are and what you face. Don't be so overwhelmed by what you face to miss his presence in the midst of it. This is not in any way to take away anything away from what people are facing. I know a lot of people in this congregation, people in my family, people in the world who are facing some terrible things, some difficult things, some trying things. Please know that our prayers, our genuine prayers and our love are with you. And our prayers are to be with one another when we face difficult times, correct? When we face trying times, when we're having difficult things in life, we have to pray for one another. That is the vocation of a Christian, and the vocation of a Christian church, to walk alongside each other. To not be the guy in the $80,000 pickup who's got to go around and ignore the others, but to care about other people, to pray for other people. That's our vocation. But regardless of what you are facing at this present hour, regardless of what you are going through, do not be overwhelmed. Do not be overcome with those feelings, for he has said, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world, and the Lord indeed has overcome the world and all that is in it. So do not be overwhelmed, but remember that he is in the midst with you, and we, with our prayers, are in the midst with you as best as we are able through the Spirit. He is with you. I want you to hear this this morning. He is with you. He is with you, and he is able and his deliverance for you may not look like what you had planned or for what you had hoped, but your plans, let alone your hopes and your dreams or your fears, your plans are no match for the height and the breadth and the depth of his love for you. A pool is nice. A pool may bring temporary healing, 
But His love incarnate in His Word, Jesus, is the salvation, all the salvation that we need in this life and in the next. Do you see that? Water is great, but His love in Jesus is the bomb. His love in Jesus is what brings the true healing that lasts. So trust in Jesus, the Word of God, and place all your hope in His name, and be made well through His grace and His love. That is the promise of God. That is the promise of God. Be made well through His grace and His love and through His name and His name alone. Be made well, I say, this day. He wanted to be carried to the holy water. The magical waters, as he thought, the healing waters in those pools. Please note again, just as a historical note, I like to give a little history. Please note, at the time of Jesus, the pools of Bezata, there wasn't a church there, but the pools of Bezata were outside the city gates of Jerusalem. It was Herod, Herod Agrippa who later brought these pools inside the city. He extended the, the, uh, the walls and brought it inside the city, Herod Agrippa. But the man wanted to be carried down to those pools. We hear in the book of Acts that the apostles went down to the river outside the city gates of Philippi where they supposed there was a place of prayer and they met a group of women there and they shared with them. So outside the gates of Philippi, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to receive the word. And when she receives the word, she and her household are baptized, which means really her household probably had people of all ages, children, youth, adults. The Bible doesn't get real specific or worry about it too much one way or the other. They heard the word and they were baptized. Lydia comes to faith, as does her household. Lydia comes to faith because God first opens her heart. You recall in the book of Exodus that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but God here opens Lydia's heart for his purposes. God, through his grace, opens her heart so she can receive the word. And by hearing Je Jesus Christ crucified and raised, preached, by hearing that preached, Christ crucified and raised, she comes to faith. We come to faith through God's grace. And we come to faith through preaching. I hope, I hope we come to faith through preaching. I hope that I'm giving a good and a timely word. We come to faith through grace and through love, and we come to faith through hearing the word shared, through preaching. Through sharing this word, we confess and we are baptized. That's what happens here in this story with Lydia and her household. Two things I leave you with as I wrap this up. In the first story, the man wanted to go to the pools. He doesn't really know who Jesus is. He doesn't make a confession of faith, but merely by being in the presence of the Lord Jesus, he is healed, he is made well. In the second story, Lydia, in the book of Acts, comes to faith through hearing the word preached, Jesus crucified and raised. She hears the word after God opens her heart. She hears the word, she receives it, and she and her household are baptized down in the river. They probably went all the way under. Maybe they were sprinkled. Maybe they were, I don't know. It doesn't, it, I don't think that matters, frankly. She heard the word. She received it. She was baptized, as were her household. Both of these things happen on a Sabbath. Now, we all know the Jewish Sabbath is the, on Saturday, the seventh day of the week, for the Lord worked on six days and rested on the Sabbath. The Christian Sabbath from the Orthodox Church from the early days became Sunday, the day of resurrection. Whether Saturday or Sunday, I'm not here to quibble on that this morning. It doesn't matter to me as much. But I want to leave you with this. It says in the Bible, man's not made for the Sabbath. Man's not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is made for man. In other words, the Sabbath is made for people to rest, to rest from their labors, to spend time with your family, to spend time with your friends, to spend time worshiping God with your church. We are driven so much, one way or the other, by this perpetual busyness in life, this perpetual busyness. You know, it says somewhere that uh, idle hands, you know what I'm going to say? Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. And as the king of procrastination, I've got to tell you, that probably is true. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. But you know, the perpetual cult of busyness isn't much better. The Sabbath is about resting, about spending time with your family, about spending time with your friends, about spending time with your church family and worshiping God. Man is not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath is made for the man. And both of these stories happen on the Sabbath. They happen on a Sabbath, in which, a special time in which we can encounter God. A special time. We weren't made to go all the time. 
if we become so overwhelmed, if we become so overcome, if we become so immersed in busyness for busyness sake, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss what God is doing in front of our noses all the time. The healing that he brings. The restoration that he brings. Without the Sabbath, we cannot be well. Without the Sabbath, we cannot be well. He brought us, he carried a man to the high mountain and he showed him the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of the heavens. Coming down out of the heavens. Redeemed, loved, changed, prepared for the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. The holy city coming down out of the heavens from God. That's a beautiful and wonderful image of the second coming of Jesus Christ and the completion of things, the fullness of things. But as you go about your week, a week in which we approach Memorial Day and we, a week in which we get very busy with preparations and different things and go into the summer, there's a different kind of busyness and that has its place. Remember all things in moderation. Remember that the Sabbath was not, man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man and for woman. Take time to be with your families. Don't be in a rush. Take time to just be with your friends. Don't rush around all the time. Take time to worship God and to be with your church family. And remember that it is the love of God in Jesus Christ to be in his presence alone that makes us well. And through this love and through this grace, we have the greatest hope for a good life here and for life eternal. Take the time to rest in Christ and to walk in the power of his name. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you now and remain with you forevermore in your walk. Amen. Well, friends, now as we come into the time of offering, I remind you, it says in the good book, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And the cheerful giver loves the Lord. Please be seated. Well, church, now we come into a time of prayer. Let us join our hearts together with prayer. Lord, this morning we pray for our, our sister Judy Green, and we pray for a friend who was recently diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. We pray for all who are suffering from cancer and fighting it. We pray for them and their families, and we lift them up, and may they know our love and our, the power of your prayer, our prayer. We pray for the Osborne family and their granddaughter who was recently diagnosed with a brain tumor. We pray this morning for those affected by the F3 tornado in Gaylord. We pray for our brother Dennis as he's recovering from his surgery. We pray for those who have not yet found the light to release themselves from hate and anger. Fill their hearts with your love, and through your love and grace, bring them healing, O Lord. Lord Christ, we pray this morning for Joe, our president, and Kamala, our vice president. We pray for Gretchen, our governor. We pray for all of our representatives in Lansing and in Washington. We pray for our Supreme Court. We pray for all of our military uh, personnel and their families. We pray for all of our public safety officers, our police officers, and our firefighters. We pray for all who are working for a more just and equitable country for people of all races, and genders, ethnicities, backgrounds, to see each other as brothers and sisters and children of one Heavenly Father. We pray for our educators and our students who will be finishing up the school year. We pray for those who are struggling with a difficult diagnosis, a medical diagnosis, a psychological diagnosis. We pray for those who are hungry and those who are homeless. 
We pray for those who are out of work or struggling with work. We pray for those with fractured relationships in families or with friends. We pray for our church. Help us, O Lord, to be agents of your healing and agents of your change. Help us to always pray for and with one another at all times and in all places. And help us, O Lord, not to be overcome by whatever it is that we're facing, but to trust in the one who has overcome all through love and the love of the cross. Lord Jesus, bless and watch over your people this day and throughout this week. For we pray the prayer that he has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. You know, church, is so much that can be overwhelming. So much that strikes, it can overcome us. It's okay to fear, that's normal, that's human. It's okay to be overwhelmed at times, there's no question about that. We, we all go through different things. I don't take anything away from that at all. And I don't know exactly what's going on with all of you right at this time, although I know what's going on with many of you as you shared. And, but I want you to know that, it, that, that it's okay on some level to be overwhelmed and be afraid and overcome, but, but know that God's with you. That's a promise of Christmas time that God is with you, you know? God is with us, Emmanuel. That's a promise of the cross that no matter what, God is with you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you face, face God is with you. And He is overcome. And He is able. And He is not going to leave you alone. And He is not going to abandon you, but He's going to be with you in the midst of it, even when 
you know, even in situations where family and friends and everyone has just abandoned you and people go through difficult times, I don't take anything away from it, but God is with you. His love will deliver you. We have this gospel today and we have the story of the book of Acts, a great story of faith and wonderful and powerful stories, but know that the love of God will see you through. The love of God will deliver you at this present hour. The love of God alone in Jesus Christ through the cross and resurrection will make you well. Because no matter what, as Paul says, no matter what you face, no matter who you are, no matter where you are in life's journey, no matter what you've done or no matter what you fail to do, nothing, nothing will separate you or me or us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. His love is sufficient. His love is sufficient. His grace is able. He and He alone will deliver you. Don't be overcome. Don't be overwhelmed. And also, don't be too busy. That is a modern sin in which I engage, in which all of us engage. Even the king of procrastination engages in busyness in one way or another. Don't be too busy to see the good things and the powerful things and the true things that are happening in your life right here and now. Give thanks for those good things and give thanks for God's presence and trust in his name. Spend time with your families. Spend time with your friends. Spend time with your church. Love one another. Pray for and with one another. Don't be the guy who has to run in front of others to get to the pool. But be the guy who carries those to the waters. You hear? Be that guy who carries the men and women and the people to the waters. Be the one who serves, the one who loves, the one who washes the disciples' feet. For in that is truth, and in that is love, and in that is hope. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be upon you today and remain with you forevermore. Go forward in the power of his love and his truth in his name. Amen.